Thank you. So thank you guys for joining us today. Um, there's a lot kind of to cover from a regulatory perspective and what you should be thinking about if you are a, an issuer of NFTs, creator of NFTs, if you are facilitating initial offerings or secondary uh, transactions. And so we're gonna be talking about some of that today. Since um, we, you already know our names, we'll just go down the line and give you just a little bit of additional context for who we are, and then we'll jump right into the substance. So as, as you know, I'm Valdehia. Um, I am a security Securities Regulatory and Compliance Lawyer, former regulator from the SEC. Jamie Schaefer, I'm a partner at Perkins Coie as well. Um, my practice focuses on anti-money laundering, anti-corruption, and economic sanctions issues. Hi everyone, uh, Chris Gossai, the managing partner of Gossai Law. We're an Australian-based cryptocurrency and corporate and commercial law firm. And my practice predominantly specializes in financial services and cryptocurrency law. My name is Asuna Guilfoyle, uh, managing partner of Guilfoyle and Allen. Um, we do compliance consulting, tax, and audit. I'm Michael. Uh, I'm one of the founders of Winter, so I'm not a lawyer, but we build a credit card checkout for NFTs, and we worked with a lot of big brands like the NFL, and we do a lot of compliance. Um, and so this is, you know, very top of mind for me and my team. So definitely, um, being a securities lawyer, um, one of the primary risk in the NFT space is the SEC's, um, how shall we say, aggressive approach um, and their position that the overwhelming majority of tokens, NFTs or otherwise, um, are securities under the US federal securities laws. And so just as you guys in your day-to-day -day practices operating your businesses, what are some of the key regulatory risks that you come across? Well, I can start. I mean pretty clear from my bio, <laughs> the key regulatory risks for the NFT space um, and for any space that sort of engages with cryptocurrency is really the anti-money laundering aspects um, and the economic sanctions. And I think they're an important point that sometimes the industry misses is the notion that these are risks that apply regardless of whether an additional regulations are passed, right? So anti-money laundering rules and economic sanctions, if you're within U.S. jurisdiction, are something that every business in the United States, right down from the widget makers to you know new and innovative technologies like NFTs, every business has to address compliance with those issues. And so, you know, in this space, there are unique risk factors um, that create even greater risks um, and even greater regulatory scrutiny, such as the ability to obscure beneficial ownership, um, the unique ability because everything is done remotely for people in high risk and sanctioned jurisdictions to utilize technology to evade sanctions and to launder you know, corruption proceeds and other criminal proceeds. Um, and then also the quick ability to turn over transactions. Um, that allows for both money laundering and sanctions evasion to happen rapidly and on a, a non-transparent basis. It also allows for a lot of fraud, um, which is another issue that can be both regulatory and commercial that all of your businesses can kind of be caught up in um, if you're not careful and don't have the right processes in place. I think I'll build on that a little bit more. Um, you know, I think the realistic nature of any NFT project or cryptocurrency project is it's going to be international. Right. So, you know, whether you're based in the U.S. or outside of the U.S., once you launch a token into the market, anyone from any jurisdiction arguably can purchase that as well. So a lot of the conversations to date has been around the SEC or um, CFTC or the U.S. regulatory ecosystem. The realistic nature is that you have to also consider other jurisdictions as well with it. So when I advise clients from an Australian perspective, we do look at the international perspective as well, and we'll engage with local council onshore here in the US because the SEC in the US is probably the, I guess, the most prominent regulator in the space. It's not going to be ASIC in Australia that will take action. It's, not, it's probably not gonna be the FCA. It's gonna be the US first and foremost, and then most of the other jurisdictions will follow from that. So whilst I definitely agree the SEC and, and the US perspective is really important, just for new product issuers or new token issuers, be mindful that when you go into other various jurisdictions, you will need to get onshore legal advice to see how your interactions with those consumers in those jurisdictions um, will be regulated as well. Um, to add on to that, so you know, we build a credit card checkout. We work very much in the traditional finance you know, portion of things. 
you know, we, you would be surprised how many projects come to us and say like invest or you'll get a return on your investment. And we ask for a legal opinion. And a lot of them are just like, what is that? Like, how do I do that? Right. Um, and like to, to add on to that, like there are so many projects that don't even think about, you know, regulatory or compliance as like a, a first class citizen of tasks to do. Um, and, you know, for us, obviously, it's so important because, you know, we help them enter in the tr traditional finance world. But um, I would even say, like, there are, are so many projects that don't even think about this when it's, like, very critically important. And, you know, obviously, there's a lot of lawyers here who can, who can help you with that. Yeah, so I'll echo all of these points together. Uh, so the biggest thing that I've seen is consumer protection risk is how I'll summarize Michael's point as well as the others. So when we advertise our products to consumers, we need to ensure that we're doing so properly and we're doing so within compliance of law so that if somebody new joins the NFT space and they see, hey, this is some new up and running idea where I can buy a house or I can buy a share of a house, which is always doing great, um, you know, we need to ensure that we're protecting them, which is a very common thing that I'm seeing currently. And just to kind of um, follow up on those points, I think if you had to distill it down, if you are issuing NFTs in the United States, then you want to consider from, you want to consider the securities regulatory risk, money transmission laws definitely are things that need to be assessed, and then for sure, AML, KYC, OFAC considerations. Um, and also, to the extent that they're going to go offshore, what are the you know, other jurisdictions, what are the potential implications there as well? Um, so from a, from a regulatory perspective, we kind of know what the current framework is. And I say that to some extent. I think a lot of people are kind of like there's a, a lack of clarity around the rules and what rules apply and when they apply. Um, and then there are people who are of the mind that the rules just don't necessarily apply. What I would say, just because you aren't complying with the rules, does not mean they're not applicable. And what you're seeing from the SEC is that they're sending that message through enforcement. And so if, you, as the industry, if you don't really assess and figure out, okay, what rules might be applicable, what does compliance look like in this context, then what you will likely see is an enforcement. There will be a reaction from regulators and what that will, that will be in the enforcement posture. Um, so just wanna, as we're thinking about, oh, Krish, what were you gonna say? No, I think that's um, a fair point too, but the other thing to consider is when you're looking at what rules apply, there are also things that people don't necessarily consider. So, you know, Suna made a great point about the consumer protection side. Um, a lot of the times, I guess, projects get caught up in regulatory. So that's whether that's you know, securities or commodities. Um, and they try to look at, are we compliant on that regulatory forefront? But often they forget about normal consumer protection that ordinarily applies. So you know, whether that's misleading deceptive conduct, false, false or misleading representations, or unconscionable conduct, those still apply in any context to any project, right? So um, getting a full broad scope of what regulatory uh, legislations or obligations apply to your business, whether that's formally you know, securities or commodities or informally like you know, general consumer protection, that's, is a, that's also a major point that I think gets lost a little bit in some of these discussions. Yeah, and, and to add on to that, um, totally agree with everything that Chris said. Like, you wouldn't even think about it, but like, we get a lot of projects that try to do NFT sweepstakes or NFT raffles and like, at least in the US, there is some regulation around how you run sweepstake or raffles, right? And you know, we, we go to a lot of these partners and we're like, hey, did you have a legal opinion on this? Like, do you, are you following the right state laws? And a lot of them are just like, what, right? Um, and so I, I think the, the, the main takeaway is like, there's probably gonna be a lot of regulatory and compliance blind spots that are pretty important to cover before you do any like big major launch with NFTs. And I would just add, you know, in that regard, I think one of the mistakes that people make is to think of these issues all in silos. When, when you're looking at your regulatory risks, I think the most important thing you can do to really streamline your processes and to make sure you're capturing all of these risks is to conduct a, a risk-based analysis that crosses all of your risk categories and have counsel um, or you know, someone in the compliance space design programs that are integrated so that you're not just designing a control for your fraud risk and designing a control for your money laundering risk and designing a control for your consumer risk, but rather someone's looking holistically at your risk profile and you can leverage 
the, the compliance infrastructure you have in place to deal with all of those risks in a kind of holistic way. And that's something that you know, can save cost as well. Um, but it's something that we see often people really identify these things in narrow ways, um, and then they're not communicating across their compliance infrastructure. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think it's not, it's not just from like basic good risk management, like from a regulatory risk management, it's also just basic legal risk management. I think in the NFT space, you've seen you know, the plaintiff's bar, the increase in private rights of action um, against NFT issuers and, and you know, parties that are engaged in the facilitation of transactions. So definitely having a holistic approach is the best type of risk management process to, to have in place. Yeah, so I worked as a risk officer, uh, chief risk officer for a couple um, NFT projects and crypto companies. And one of the things that we're seeing is uh, chief executive officers and people who represent uh, licensed organizations, so those who have um, MTLs, is they, they believe that their company is separate from them in the extent that if they tweet, hey, buy Bitcoin. So for example, um, one of my companies that I was working with, their CEO made a uh, NFT purchasing app and they scratched out, you know, in uh, using the markup app on their iPhone, you know, the sell button, they said only buy. And that was a very important discussion of you can't do that because you're telling your clients to not per to not sell something and to hold on to it, which is now a recommendation. Um, and that's an exceptionally common thing where executives, you know, just get into a job but they have no experience or no understanding of the, the broad scope of these risks. Yeah, great point. So when you guys are thinking about the current regulatory framework and looking, you know, down the road, around the corner, what are you, what are you anticipating? Well, from the anti-money laundering and sanctions perspective, I think it's, it's good to realize that the Department of Justice issued its like annual memo to the president highlighting the priorities for additional regulatory consideration and NFTs was specifically named in that report last fall. Um, we don't know what that regulation will look like, but that gives you a sense for the level at which our government is really focusing on the money laundering risks and the sanctions evasion risks that this industry can pose. Um, so it's important to think ahead of those things because once those regulations come down the pike, you'll find yourself in a situation where everything you did in the past is scrutinized. And remember, if you are engaging with the United States, it doesn't matter that you don't have anti-money laundering obligations to have specific compliance controls in place. You are still subject to US money laundering laws and US sanctions laws. Anyone engaging with the United States is. So when you're thinking about what does the future look like, I think the future looks like more regulations targeting this space, but you should also thinking, what am I doing today that I'm gonna be held accountable for tomorrow? And I agree with that point. From an international perspective as well, that holds true. So. In Australia, what we're seeing is that the government are undertaking a token mapping exercise to really understand what are the various types of tokens that we have in the market, whether that's an NFT or a security token, a meme coin, um, a payment token. So um, we're starting from scratch in Australia and then building uh, regulations on top of that. But we can, also, we can also see in other jurisdictions like the UK, for example, right? They're trying to push a more crypto-friendly jurisdiction um, to foster innovation and um, investments into the UK. In Europe, we have Mika um, coming on board. In Dubai, uh, there's a lot of crypto businesses moving there because the ecosystem and the regulatory ecosystem is quite friendly as well. So from an international perspective, it varies quite significantly, right? And we will rely upon the US to, to some extent, especially since you know the SEC will be the primary enforcement regulator globally. Um, but again, when it comes back to my point, if you're going to launch a project, um, what's on the horizon is massive changes in multiple jurisdictions around the world. I think that a lot of crypto companies currently, um, NFTs specifically, are relying upon opinions from the SEC, let letters of no action, that you know are maybe a couple years old. You know, uh, one of my clients I'm working with has a letter from 2018, and they feel that they're heavily reliant on that. That says, nope, as long as you follow within these parameters, you know, you are not going to break any laws. And I absolutely see that changing, and I see a lot of companies. Uh, 
going to be suffering because of that. Um, and as we look towards the future, the next couple of years, that posture needs to change and looking towards either getting new opinions or looking at what is it that we are doing and, and will this be targeted specifically, especially in terms of fractional real estate or uh, regulated goods such as securities or gold. Yeah, uh, I guess going back to Val's question, like I think I'm hoping for more clarity on you know crypto, Web3, and specifically NFTs, but um, I think there's a lot of gray areas right now in NFTs. A lot of companies are operating in gray areas. They're not sure if they're like 100% legal or not. I think what I'm anticipating though, maybe a little bit is uh, some more uh, enforcement by you know some of these lawsuits like what you know the SEC is potentially doing with you know Coinbase. Um, so I think what I'm hoping for is more clarity so that companies can operate in you know non gray areas, and I'm anticipating a little bit uh, you know some some enforcement by actions. I think with NFTs, it's an interesting asset class compared to other cryptocurrency or digital assets, right? So NFTs vary quite significantly. It, it could just be a, a JPEG image, or when we're talking about fractionalized real estate, we can look at it somewhat like a derivative asset, right? There's an underlying asset underneath that could be a regulated asset, and it's just been tokenized and a proof is on the blockchain instead. I mean, outside, there's a, uh, a cool stand that has sneakers, right? And, and you send your sneaker off to a vault, they'll create an NFT for you, um, and you can trade that, and I assume you can redeem uh, your NFT for the sneaker afterwards. So Whilst we talk about NFTs and the key regulatory risks for NFTs itself, it's important to note that you can't view all NFTs in the same bucket. And we can't just say, I've got an NFT, whether it's fractionalized real estate or a derivative or a JPEG, it's all going to be viewed the same way. Um, and importantly as well, as your project evolves, you may offer other benefits associated with that NFT. So at the start, it could just be a JPEG. We're building a great community. Then you've got airdrops afterwards, you have token releases, um, games, other benefits that's associated to it. The regulatory stance initially will then change as you start to develop and issue new products and new innovations on top. So it is an evolving space. And from a legal and regulatory risk point of view, it's, just to be, it's, it's important to stay up to date with it um, and always continually take a proactive approach instead of a reactive when you get to knock on the door from a regulator asking what's happening with this project. Yeah, I actually 100% agree with, with what Chris just said. And like, I really see NFTs as like a core piece of technology and the technology itself like, you know, doesn't do anything good or bad, but there are bad things that you can do with the technology. There are regulated things that you can do with the technology. Like there's already a bunch of financial tools you know, being represented as NFTs, but there's also like collectibles, which you know, some would argue are not securities that are represented as, as NFTs. And so, so what Chris said, it's really important to like uh, deeply understand the use case and where regulation applies to the use case of NFTs. I think those are critical factors when you're thinking about what compliance looks like for your business, because absolutely, the underlying asset, the underlying transaction, that's what you need to look at when you're thinking about risk factors. And frankly, you know, from a regulatory perspective, a lot of these underlying assets have a long history of compliance expectations by regulators. The art and antiquities market is a great example. Right now, FinCEN is considering, FinCEN is our financial sort of anti-money laundering regulator, is considering proposed regulation of the art and antiquities market. And there are tons of reports, and there are already sort of deeply established compliance expectations in that market. So applying that to NFTs that really fit that mold it's not a perfect map, but it is a very useful, very probative kind of place to start when you're thinking about what are my risk factors and what should compliance look like. And in almost any kind of asset class as we would think about it, you can find that the underlying transaction has some corollary to, tra to traditional markets that you can use then to build appropriate infrastructure. As well, I'll speak quickly as, as the tax geek here, but um, one of the things is that w when something is considered a piece of artwork, uh, there's a lot of tax implications of that. So for example, nonprofits in the, in the United States, if they receive a gift that is a piece of artwork of a certain value, they have to declare that, they have to say why was this purchased, what did this do, et cetera. And if I, for example, donate one of my NFTs to a nonprofit, for example, my own, I need to state what was that given, you know, what value does it have? So 
a lot of companies are just trying to hope that, hey, let's just beg for forgiveness later. And it's something to look at that the SEC and other regulatory bodies are not regulating you know, these stock certificates. They're regulating the companies they're attached to. And that is the biggest thing to remember is we're not regulating NFTs. We're regulating what are they representing? What is the token attached to? I, would, I absolutely agree with that. Um, I think that when you're thinking about NFTs, to Chris's point, it's really about you know, how is it being used? How, how is it being offered and sold? What are the reasonable expectations of the person on the receiving end? Whether that's from a consumer protection perspective or whether it's from a, you know, can I, can I buy this and immediately turn around and sell it on a secondary market for potentially, to make a potential profit or to arbitrage it in some kind of way? Um, and so that's what, at the end of the day, regulators have the benefit of hindsight. So as you're looking at, when you're thinking through like product counseling and you're figuring out, okay, how do I launch my product? What are the things that I need to consider? Then you have to be kind of looking to, you know, way down the road and be, okay, how is this gonna come back? How is this, how is a reasonable consumer going to view this? How is a regulator going to view this? How will a court view this? Um, so I think that those are, those are things that just fundamentally have to be at the forefront of your mind because it is a high risk area. There's no question about that. So I wanted to, oh, did you wanna I think something? the hindsight point is really important. Um, so I mean, from a consumer protection point of view, uh, I led one of the first class actions, or the first class action in Australia against a cryptocurrency co company. And they were an issue of tokens. Um, the basis for that was twofold. One was, if it was a regulated financial product, they'd breached the ASIC Act in Australia. So representations that were made to consumers, so you know, false misleading representations, um, misleading deceptive conduct, unconscionable conduct. And then if it wasn't a regulated product, so you know, say it's not, uh, doesn't fall within the purview in the US of the Harvey test or any of the regulatory um, tests here in the US or in Australia, just general consumer law, right? So again, the same elements under general consumer law, but the hindsight point is, was really important for that matter. So what we did, we looked at the white paper, we went back and sorted different iterations of the white paper. So traced it back on Wayback Machine, um, saw what articles they were posting online, saw what articles, um, or news, social media posts they were posting on Facebook, uh, Twitter, et cetera, and we found that there were contradictory statements being made. Um, and the way they represented to clients and to consumers to induce them into purchasing varied, and, and the promises they made initially didn't hold true, and they tried to scrub over it to issue a new white paper, a version 2.0, and say this was you know what you signed up to when that wasn't the case. So um, it's really important to, you know, when you're starting an NFT project, have a good think about it at the start and think about what that life cycle looks like um, and plan properly from the beginning so you're not just making it up on the go and getting caught in, uh, I guess, regulatory uncertainty as well. Well, thank you. That's pretty much our time. Thank you guys so much. If you have any questions, you know who we are. So um, thanks for taking the time to be with us. <laughs>